Hello, we're back again. Um, we've just done the uh, actually. <laughs> it's it's BSA. We should stand up really, shouldn't we, and salute. <laughs> um, last episode we did Virax. Uh, this episode we're going to do BSAs, BSA. and the few we're going to do and some two other things as well. Things well as I'm going to match your German sauerkraut with a bit of British beef. Okay. And what we have here is a superstar. A superstar. Yeah. So this this is a, a rifle from the heyday, really, of BSA spring guns. Probably not in the same league as a seventy seven no. or a TX. No, not quite. I probably wouldn't mind me saying that. But what a beautiful rifle! I mean, look at the classical styles of that. It was lighter weight. Yes. Uh, the advantages of the, of the BSA it was lighter weight. Um, it had a great, a, 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 the max grip scope rail was an absolute oh, star. Now this sort of took over really from the um, the Airsporter, didn't it? Really, yeah. the Airsporter had gone out of. They did an RB a rotary breech version of the Airsporter, mm. and then they wanted to do a conventional underleaver. One of my favourite BSAs yeah. was the RB two Stutzen. Remember with the long. That's right. Yes. Beautiful, yes. beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Not a thing. great gun to fire. Crap. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I like you said that, but this was better. It was nicer, but it was more basic. Uh, did it, what was the price compared to a 77? Uh, it was about the set, of, I think they came out at about 259. Right. But I can't remember what the fire acts were at the time. I think they were, I think they were maybe 10 or 15 quid dearer. Right. So obviously if customers came in and they wanted the best, I, we, we sold them a, a fire act. Hmm. But if they wanted something that was lightweight to carry around, blah 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 blah, and, and look nice because the bluing on this is just the blue. You can almost you can almost yeah. see your face. In it. No, it's really something yeah. to, to have pride in. So what a great rifle! And this really carried on for probably about what, ten years, something like that, seven, eight, yeah, eight, eight, eight years, yeah, I eight think. years, yeah, and carried on. But then sales died off, and uh, Peter Martin, who was the salesman at the time, I rang him up to do a little bit of research, and he said when sales tailed off to the point where it wasn't worth making. They just quietly faced it. They could, I told you, you know what? If they'd made a Mark II yeah. with, with updated looks, in fact, you know when you get, you know, you buy a car and they get halfway through and they go to like, well, we don't want to change it too much, so we'll put a new grill on it and then maybe new wing mirrors and blah blah yeah. blah blah blah. If they'd just done that to that to, to keep it lift. relevant yeah. and and take away the 1950s trigger guard and perhaps uh, a not so nice trigger. Uh, that was a bit nothing like a bar. Actually. No, it yeah. was adjustable, and yeah. you know you could polish it and everything. But yeah. it just and also as well, I always felt that whereas the Virac looked like a Winchester at the front, this looked like there was. I mean, it did have a it did have an open sight on, but it just didn't look finished. Mm. No, it didn't I kind of like right. that. I think I prefer that. It, yeah, I like. The style. I'm glad everybody's different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also as well, the rotary breech was fantastic, but it had a major flaw. And that was if you didn't read the instructions and you didn't operate it right, um, you would. If, and if you cocked it while that was closed, remember, it used to da yeah, it used to damage the O rings and yeah. all sorts. And of course, stuff. you end up with a long transfer port. Massively That's a, long, and that is a problem. So you've got all yeah. that air expanding into the transfer port, not just going straight from one chamber to another. Very the inefficient. The has got. What four mil, three mil? Yeah, it's about four mil. Yeah, what's that? I, inch and a quarter. I think you know, I think yeah. that was twelve mil, if I remember right. rightly. Yeah. So whatever that but is, that that's bad, about yeah. half an inch. Yeah, yeah. But it's right. still, yeah. well, it's three times longer than the Vara. I yeah. know it doesn't sound important, but again, if you know anything about car engines, yeah. you know, like lengths, uh, lengths of inlet tract and yeah, stuff. Yeah, side like valve versus overhead valve, big difference. Big difference. Same yeah. thing going on here. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, a problem, but a convenient way, and of course, you're not going to get your fingers trapped. Yes. Yes. So that's another nice. And the safety catch, if I remember rightly, you could put it. On once you took it off, yes, which is also quite useful once and you've been stung with the bar art thing of missing the target because you take the off, yeah, so that's quite good. That's so, a, it did yeah. have advantages. Yeah. And, and another little interest in the side um, BSA worked with Theoban and they actually produced one of these uh, prototype. And there's some of them came out of the factory, weren't there, with the gas ram in it. Yes. Which actually, funnily enough, I know that some people don't like gas rams, and some people absolutely well, love them. Of course, they did the gas ram light. on the Vire. I mean, famously did the gas ram on the Vire on the HW on the 90. 90, which you didn't cover. Well, I, I, I didn't cover it because, I, I, I'll tell you why I didn't cover the 90, <laughs> and that's because I wanted to do classic Virax, and, and the 90 is not a classic no. Virax. It's sort of, it was an interesting experiment that Theoban paired up with Virac, didn't they? That's right. And they produced this abomination, yeah. in my opinion, of a gun. It was... Well, it wasn't. It wasn't everybody. The other was very really heavy because it was. It was a high power. It was kind of an eighty with a gas ram, wasn't it? Really. Um, yeah, it's sort of that way. With a poorer trigger. Yes. With and, and with reliability problems on the trigger, and yeah. it was huge. It was a bit ugly. Yeah. 
And I know effort was amazingly know, difficult, wasn't it? That, yeah. that's, that throw and getting that back. Yeah, and, and it, it almost felt like that, um, you know, when you combine two great things, sometimes the sum of it doesn't quite work out. And I thought that I loved the Auburn, uh, and I still love the Auburns, and I love Virac, but when they combined the two together, something didn't work, and it was... it was and it, that's the it, 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 That was the 90s. Well, I'm going to balance your bad German rifle with a bad British one. How about that? Okay. For a nice link. That's okay. lovely. That's lovely rifle. So after that, there was a couple of years where they didn't have an underlever, and Vierce at the time was owned by Gamo. They're still in the same group. And the uh, at Gamo. Oh, no, that's not. It's not. That's not a Spanish BSA. This is a Spanish BSA, and this is the Polaris. And somebody at Gamo said, "Oh, BSA need an underlever. Let's make one." So what they've done is this. Now I've got to say, as it's possibly the worst air rifle I've ever had. I actually. like the look of it. Yeah, it, it looks better than the super. It looks more modern than the Superstar. But go on, there's bound to be a well, catch. Well, it's, it's they've taken a brake barrel gamo rifle and they've locked the breech up and they've stuck on an underlever underneath it. So there's your start starter for ten. They then milled a slot in there to put a rotary breech in behind the. You can see where the brake barrel oh, lock up grief, was. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And okay. they've engraved the BSA logo on it. It's got gamo finish, so nothing like the beautiful finish of the previous rifle. And a gamo stock, which they presumably had kicking around the factory and decided it needed to have it on. So you've got gamo, 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 BSA name, and I think they've even cheekily put on the side made for BSA by gamo España. The so, thing is, the thing is, I mean, you can we can we can criticise looks and everything, but what about the performance? How does it, have you shot it? Never shot one, no. Because I've shot no. the CF thirty, yes, which looks like it's based on the CF thirty, which again is a yes, camera wonder lever, yes. which it wasn't. I mean, do you know what? It was shootable, mm. but it wasn't. It wasn't worth the money. And, yeah. and actually, if the so it, are you making the point that it's a good gun to shoot or a bad gun to shoot? I would say it was. I'd say it was okay for the money. But if you try to compare it with something from Varac, proper BSA, blah 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 blah, it was wasn't great. Well, do you know what the good thing about this rifle is? Cheap, collectible. They oh. hardly sold any. Therefore, they're rare. Mm. So, um, and this one came from Bob. This came from City Air Weapons uh, Sorry, in Solihull. Just... Yeah. Oh. It's got, okay, that trigger unit, believe it or not, yeah. I, I, again, the little trivia question, that trigger unit, what really expensive rifle was, did that unit have? Uh, did, did, did that use? Ah, no, I don't know. Rapid 7. Oh, of course, because they got it from Gamma. Yeah, that's right. So they, actually, they had a so really this is actually really, really bad triggers. Yeah, they, for yeah. a while. This is this has got this has got yeah. something in, yeah. in, in in. Yes, of course it did. Yeah, so in other did. words, it, it's in in one respect, there's one bit of it that's as good as a rapid seven. <laughs> Let's say positive. <laughs> but actually, the trigger unit on some rifles, um, especially on the rapid seven, because you've got like very little sear pressure, was yeah. a lot better than what it was in some of the brake barrel rifles that was holding back a lot more pressure. It, and what I'm trying to say is, in the brake barrels, it wasn't nice it was creepy it was quite heavy um but i i sort of and, and actually it's still light so yeah. I, I think we should probably get one of these on the range eventually and, i think and, so and give it you a go it. yeah we, it, it's funny actually because um this is why i'm wearing a beer so we so we work out why i've got this yes up. go on then, the, the beer, it's all right no the, we had a we had a lovely visit from the well, I, I said that we're going to do a bsa special and we're going to be really polite about bsa and i've just been really nasty no I said, well, we've got, you've yeah. got to be honest yes. yeah we've got to be honest right. yeah. we had a we had a lovely visit from the bsa uh, yeah. rep and he brought uh, another guy in from bsa um and after he asked me the initial question he's like what what have you got a problem with bsa and i said of course i haven't I said, because evidently some people uh, have taken it that if I criticise something, that means I've got a problem with the company. It doesn't mean that. What it means is I've got a problem with the product. I actually really like BSA. I've always got on with BSA really well. There's some lovely people down at the factory. Absolutely fantastic. But you know what? I can understand it. When you when I've criticised, I criticise the bullpup. You take it personally. That I do sometimes. Yeah, you know. Like, oh, what does so he they, know? So they came yeah. in. And do you know what was really cool is yeah. they're really interested in what other retailers have to say as well because they're asking me and said yeah. what do you want to see what would you like and actually i did you know you remember this the superstar yes well they did a 10 shot you haven't got one have you? no no they, no, got, they, well, they did it oh no the, the gold, gold star. star yeah they did a special they, they did a, a, a 2000 what was that the, the s2000 the s2000 which that, never came out no uh, i saw but, one of those yes yeah. yeah but they did a gold star with a 10 shot rotary magazine yeah 
And I said, well, I, I said, do you know what, I, what I'd absolutely love? I'd love a BSA Gold Star, so in other words, underlay the cocking, just like the Superstar, yeah. 10 shot magazine, but modern. I said, redo it, make yes. it really, really good because we've got enough pre-charged, we've got enough cheap pre-charged to sink a battleship, haven't we, mm. these days? Absolutely. Um, we've got lots of cheap springers, but we've not really got that many good springers. And the caveat that I made was I said that we want to see it made in the BSA factory. And I hope everybody agrees with me here. If you've ever shot an original BSA spring gun and then shot the Gamo spring gun, the BSAs are a lot, a lot I, I know, better. I know that they moved, I think it's about 2007, uh, Christmas 2007, mm. they moved, or they decided they were going to move the production of BSA spring guns to Barcelona. Yeah. So that's probably why things like this sort of came, came along. Yeah. But um, I've heard a rumour that it's coming, it's gone back. Is that true? Maybe, um, you say, maybe someone put in the comments whether that's true or not. When I spoke to, the, when I spoke to them, I, I was very, you know, I really, I think it's really important that BSA do make the, the spring guns again. Not because, not because I've got anything against Gamow, because I, I, I think Gamow have got their place in the ego market and, mm. and a fantastic and a massive place actually. Yes, but I just sort of think that like, you know, it, to put the name of BSA on, a, on a, a rifle that's not made by BSA, although you could argue it's made by the same holding company, blah, 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 but it's not made by BSA. Yeah. I want to see BSA quality and the quality that, that BSA were renowned for before this happened. And of course it's changed now because BSA and Gamma are in the same group. Yes. Originally back when this gun was made, BSA was owned by Gamma. Owned by Gamma, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can't say too much, but when you ask a direct question like, please, for God's sake, make, you know, make BSA... Well, they can't give you an answer because they can't make a decision on based on your what. No, but well, there's a hesitation, yeah. which I have a funny feeling. Well, it could be that they're doing something. I think, yeah. I think, do you know what? I, I wouldn't put money on it, but I think there's a very, very good chance that we're going to start seeing BSA spring guns made by BSA in Birmingham again. I've got a funny feeling about it. And do you know what? I think it'd be a fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. I think that the prices might go up, but also as well, the quality will go up. And I think it would, uh, if BSA can bring something out that, that is competitive, uh, and I don't want to see something cheap. I want to see something nice. There's you know, no something reason. Good. I mean, back in the day, you know, Spanish production was cheaper than UK production. That's very, very much changed with CNC and the way that they put guns together now, and the world market for parts. Mm. So it should go back to, to Birmingham. Anyway, back to small. Yeah. So that that was the story, uh, and it was lovely for BSA to come in and and to talk to us and ask us questions. And it sounds like they're really interested now mm -hmm. uh, in what the retailer has to say. And they want to get like a load of retailers together to talk about things and to like work on the future plans and everything. And it, it, it's really good that manufacturing, in my opinion, involves some retailers. And I said to them, I said, don't just get all the top retailers. I said, let's get a spread of retailers from the guy like on your local high street, etc., etc. And I think there's, I think there's real interest in, in BSA moving forward. And I think they, you know, although I haven't liked the last two guns they produced. Yeah. Um, that could just be me and blah blah blah. It could be a quirk, uh, and I think maybe the next thing they bring it could be absolutely fantastic. So I'm hoping it is. If it's going to be a spring, a good quality spring gun, I'm itching for it. I think it'd be great. Brilliant. I've right, got, I've got one more. Oh, do you remember Webley? Yes, very yeah. well. Still going, of course. But this is back in their Birmingham days. So we're talking about Birmingham, ten miles away. Oh, I think it was ten or oh, eclipse. eclipse. This is the eclipse. So this is pretty interesting. So Webley and Scott, as they were. Uh, decided that they needed an underlever rifle, but they were British and they were going to do things differently. So what they did, they did an aluminium cylinder spring gun. Now that's very mm. makes it supposedly a lot lighter. It mm -hmm. doesn't feel a lot lighter. No. But it's supposed to be a lot lighter, and that was their sales pitch. They also had this very interesting uh, loading mechanism with a flip open breech. Mm. A lot of people try to get the pellet in there, but actually, of course, you loaded the pellet in there. You've got this transfer port here. Like you've got an angle here, so the piston's stopping about here, and then you've got a transfer port distance of 15, 20 mil. Yeah, that's getting on for an inch, isn't yeah. it, really? Uh, yeah. like, like definitely 20 mil plus. 20 mil, and that ruined it. Um, but there was another problem, and that was availability. They launched it one year and made it the next. And I think that was due to whatever reason was going on inside the factory. So there was a good year between the launch and production. Very I really liked the Eclipse. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't shoot awesomely well, but I tell you what, it was certainly good enough as a field gun. Yes. Um, a couple of problems I found with the Eclipse is, is that they have a pin that runs through the back of the cylinder there. Yes. Well, you know, alloy is softer. 
Um, or generally, generally they're softer than steel. Um, mm. Oh yeah, in fact, actually, one third this of is, the strength. Yeah, yeah. Oh, unless yeah. it's a really good alloy, yeah. and, and the thing is, uh, you know, good no. alloys no, are very expensive. Cheese. That's, this is, this that's is cheese the, alloy, yeah, is it? Yeah, it's a special so make. 50% yeah. cheese, 50% metal. Yeah. But anyway, it actually... What Easy happened, to recycle. The yeah. pin that used to, used to lit, slowly but surely elongate the holes. Yes. And if you remember in those days, I don't know whether anybody remembers this, but everybody had a thing for like getting one of these guns or any spring gun and ruining it by putting an ox mainspring in it. Mm. And, 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 you know, what would happen is the extra stress would rip that pin out the back and eventually they'd stop cocking. Yeah. But also another interesting thing was is that they anodized the inside of the cylinder as well as the outside. And if anybody knows anything about anodizing, anodizing it, um, there's, it has a lot of friction, doesn't yeah. it? So what we found is not only have you got a hideous amount of, of efficiency loss through the transfer port, but whatever efficiency was left was removed by the anodizing. So what we used to do, we used to have to lap it yeah. And, and, and literally remove all the anodizing yeah. uh, before we could really do yeah, anything. And of course, it didn't need to be anodized. It makes it harder, mm. you know, for the aforementioned cheese, but it's but it still uh, causes a friction, and it's because it's not going to corrode because you've got greases in there, and really no reason for it to corrode. Mm. But they, you know, that would it, when you also anodize, as well if you, you scratch it, it, yeah, that's you're done. You're aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the the, posit the the real positives, it was a little bit lighter than the seventy seven. Yes. Um, it had the best safety catch. Yeah, this has been carried right forward to the modern day. The one thing you can say about the the, the safety catch the safety is catch brilliant. Is absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Resettable, auto set, uh, applies when yep. you cock it, and then you can take it off and put it back on again. Yeah, and it's what well, talk about being in the right place. Yeah, perfect. And it really is just just exactly where you need it. Well, I, I shot in the clips for a little while until I realised it wasn't as good as a seventy seven. No. Um, but more we, expensive I, than seventy seven. It think, was dear yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, I love the safety catch. I actually really like the stock mm. um, because that was based on, in fact, that was actually from the Webley Amiga, wasn't it? That's right. And I think the stock was roughly a Webley Amiga just with some changes on the forehead. Yeah. I like the fact that it's got, I mean, that's, you know, little touches like the pistol grip cap. That's uh, really nice. Also, as well, another thing I loved about it is mm -hmm. that instead of having to drill your own stock, which, and I've seen some hideous. Examples yeah, it's of quite amazing stock. how off some people can be when they put a stock. I, I, I've seen it where they've drilled and it's actually come out the side of the stock. Yeah. But my favourite was actually we had a gun in, and when the guy brought it in, it had the, the this is no word of a lie, it had the, the, the sling swivel in the cheek piece. Yes. So I thought, well, if he's got it in the, in the cheek piece there, maybe he's left handed. But he wasn't, he was right handed, but he got this swivel in the cheek piece. And to this day, I'm like, oh, I don't well, understand that. But that that little touch there, you could obviously just unscrew that, screw your swivel yeah, in. Interesting the position of it, how far back was it is. I mean, it, one of the problems with fitting sling swivels, if you ever fit one, is that so you've got stock screws, wood screws going through the butt pad. So make sure you drill far enough, far forward. enough forward that you're not going to put your wood drill straight into a metal um, screw which holds the butt pad on. Mm. So you generally go an inch and a half in anyway. If you're in there, then you're in the land of hurt. If the stud, if the screw's in the wrong place, but they've put that right back, haven't they? Yeah. Where's the front one go? Um, if I remember rightly, I think it might have come with a front swivel, but uh, 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 everybody put it there. Yeah, so it's on the. Uh, and the nice thing is with those lock, ones, you've, you've actually got a, a lovely yeah. sort of spigot design with a lock, which yeah. again. At the time, the 77 was awkward. This was lovely. Didn't it come with an optional silence, a plastic silence? It was, it was, yeah. uh, actually it was, it was alloy. And yeah. It was about that big and it was hopeless, but it, yeah. it looked sort of cool okay. being hopeless. But it's threaded. It is threaded. It's a weird Long thread. Long way round. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's a weird thread. So if you ever pick one of these up second hand, don't try shoving a half inch UNF in because it's just, well, it will, it, it'll be too slack. Mm -hmm. So you need a special thread, which I can't remember what it was at the moment. <laughs> and this came with open sights as standard. The rear mm -hmm. sight's missing off this particular one, but do you know what, overall, I, I thought it was a damn it good It deserves effort. to succeed, but I think the delay in between the marketing effort and the release of the product was so long that they'd wasted all their marketing effort. And by the time it came out, other things were out. And actually, the impetus to sell it had gone. Yeah. People who wanted it didn't want it anymore. Yeah. And I think that 87 is the launch date, and 88 was the Something first ones like in the shops. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it was. Um, collectability-wise, not so much at the moment, but actually that's a good thing because 
If I'm saying it's collectible, that means it's already gone up in value. Yeah. I think the Eclipse probably in years to come, especially ones in good condition with the open sights, preferably boxed, obviously, yeah. not used so much. Um, will this probably... is in nice condition. It's got a little bit of wear, but you know, it's nothing. Yeah, it's pretty good actually. Yeah. Um, but if you can pick, if you're a collector out there and you see one of these in the shop, it's in the mint condition, and probably if it was, I don't know, two fifty or less, I would say you'll make money on it in future. Uh, and in the meantime. Although it's not the best to shoot, you'll certainly enjoy shooting it. Mm -hmm. So nice, no, good effort, okay. good effort from Webley. Lovely. Right. Well, that's me out of spring guns. Well, I've noticed you've got some like uh, paperwork on the desk that we yes, talked about we in the last. Yes, we did cover that in the last episode. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's come up over between the last series and this series is the um, the general license uh, doodah. Mm. So basically, what happened was that. Um, in not, so the story as I get it is that the EU, or EC, as it probably was, in 1980, um, decided that they would ban shooting of birds. Mm. So this obviously is going to affect farmers, pest controllers, and all sorts of livelihoods and crop control for the UK. So the UK got around this ban by installing a, a general licence. And a general licence was something that you, it, you were still prohibited to shoot birds but you could apply for a general license, and eventually it was done online, mm -hmm. um, and that allowed you permission to shoot certain type of birds. And the type of birds you could shoot was specified on the general license. But it wasn't everything, and it, it wasn't a carte blanche license to go and shoot birds. You had to follow certain protocols, and this was covered in the general license. You had to try a less lethal option mm -hmm. before you started. You had to be able to try to shoot them away, bird scarers, um, you had to try scarecrows or walking the land. And <clears throat> only once those criteria had been met were you allowed to shoot the birds. But it gave you a list of what you could and couldn't shoot. And in fact, one of the things I've been involved in is bird recognition courses. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But you have to know the difference between a feral pigeon and a wood pigeon and, uh, and what is allowed to shoot and when and uh, with what. Mm -hmm. So these rules were there. But I think it's fair to say not a lot of people knew about that. No, I agree with you, yeah. yeah, yeah so, um, so there was undoubtedly a whole lot of abuse going on as people felt that they could just go on to a piece of land or their garden or their property and shoot what the hell they liked. Mm. And that is not the case. The general license gave terms and conditions that you could do. So whether you agree with it or not, that's not our concern. The law of the land said that you had to conform to these, these rules and regulations. But they were pretty much unknown outside of the industries and they were probably being abused by a certain amount of people. So then, that brings us on to the modern day, doesn't mm, it? It does. Yeah. So really what happened is that um, there was a legal challenge uh, to the general licence, and the general licence has been controlled by Natural England, mm -hmm. who were issuing the licences, and it said that they looked at it and they took advice from their solicitors and said, if we go to court, are we safe? And the advice they were given was, no, you're no, not no, safe. No. no. So they revoked the general license. Uh, and I don't know if that was the intention. And I've had a little bit, a few interesting conversations with people, sort of off record, saying that they really, uh, I was told that they really didn't want this to happen. What they were trying to do was push rural, natural England into getting something better into place. Uh, not go oh my God, we better revoke this, mm. you know? So they were intending them to get something a bit more robust, a bit more well-known, with a bit few more controls, because if you had a general license, and you, you were pretty much bulletproof, pardon the pun. So uh, they, they were trying, to, trying, as I understand it, to get a better, more robust license in place. But what actually they ended up doing was killing the general license and it being withdrawn. And then there was a couple of weeks where nobody knew where they were. Yep. And this coincided with the lambing season, with the birth of songbirds, the nesting uh, songbirds, yep. at exactly the wrong time when you actually did need pest controls on crows and magpies, etc. Everything stopped. And crops in the field, and this is what, it, and, you, know, uh, it, you know, it's a horrible thought, but the farmers were unallowed to shoot the crows, and the crows were multiplying pecking lamb's eyes out mm. and you had to deal with the, with the lamb. Mm. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, that's what happened. So um, a, pretty soon afterwards, a new license was put up, but vague. 
and I think that's what it was. And it was uh, permission to take specific types of birds. You had to give your location where you're going to shoot. You had to apply for each type of bird separately. Mm -hmm. But you could do it. People got them uh, nat naturally and got on with it. It must have been. There must be a backstory there of how they how they managed to get them all out. Some people got them. Some didn't. Some talk of whether it needed to be actually granted or whether it was after applying for it was good enough. Uh, and that's pretty much where we are now, except that Michael Gove has gone on and said that the whole thing's over and we are put the government's taking uh, control of, um, of this off natural England and it's going to be controlled by DEFRA. So that's Do you think that's going. good news for the shooting industry? Uh, who knows? Because um, there are, you know, this story I've just given, it could be wrong, it could be qualified in a different way. There's, it's an ongoing story. I think it's a, it's a good thing that we have control, you know, and then we just don't, because it needs to be controlled. Yes. But at the I same agree. time, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be availability for when professionals who do take their job seriously and do absolutely want to obey the law because that's their livelihood at stake if they don't, mm -hmm. um, they need to have clear guidance and need to do their job. Uh, at the same time, you don't want people running around, you know, uncontrolled with guns because they give the industry a bad name. Mm. And, and that's uh, where we are with it. Um, we're waiting to see what comes out. It's under control of DEFRA. DEFRA will do a good job, that's for sure. Um, and poor Natural England caught it between the teeth, didn't they? Um, yeah, it's, um, I, I think there's been a... a, a I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit worried about covering this um, because... It is a worry because we can, we can go on one side of the fence or the other with very little information. Uh, yeah, yeah, also as well, unfortunately, um, what I've noticed is, is that um, I posted something on uh, my gun shop's Facebook page and uh, you know what, there's a lot of reasonable people out there that, uh, that actually like, might look into it or might like not partic not say anything until they get the full facts. And unfortunately, there's some people that go off half cocked and start having start being overly critical of, of well, certain people They were doing involved. personal and attacks on people we all know who we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, really, what's that going to achieve? Uh, well, because, it's going to achieve. Yeah, it's going to. Yeah. They're going to show that the, the, the general public that actually there are some shooters out there that that, sh that are irresponsible and probably, you know, um, yeah. and a, a very good reason for gun control, which is not what we want. Exactly. So yeah. uh, you know, it's it, we need to show that that you know the, the compassionate um, ecological face of the gun industry, which yeah. are really interested in looking after nature mm -hmm. uh, and not going out there killing anything that moves. And those people exist, but they're not. The general no. status, and when those people no, come not. to fore and start doing personal attacks on people, yeah. it's out of order. So, j just a just a little one, guys. Um, you know, if you've got any thoughts on this subject, please, you know, we're, feel free to say. But just just bear in mind that obviously YouTube is a like an open forum, and and, and what we say can be well not necessarily misinterpreted, but can be read by anybody. So, if you've got any comments, yeah, by all means, make them. Um, uh, but just keep the, you know, if anybody's obviously, and I'm sure a lot of people have been vet, have been angered by this yeah, well, issue, can, and I can understand it. I can but hear you know somebody what? now saying, well, you don't know what you're talking about, they shouldn't have done this, but they did do it. Yeah. And, and this is where we are. Maybe right? maybe keep your anger for your own personal self, and, and you know what, let's, let, let's, let's show the general public that we're actually, we are a bunch of sensible, uh, ecologically. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, guy. You know, so like, I have a think about it. Anyway, and I can hear the kettle whistling from here. So, uh, so yeah, we'll talk. I think the camera needs winding we'll, up. Well, we're going to talk about. Uh, we've obviously still got the. Uh, we've still got the AGT stuff, which is. Yeah, I've got a couple of things to balance your uh, your imports. Yes, I know. Uh, quality checkers of acting products, and they are quality. <laughs> they are really good quality. So we'll come back anyway. We'll talk about. We'll talk about that. You know, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye.